really happy to be here. Breakthrough has been focusing a lot on nitrogen in the recent months, and I'm here to talk about the future of fertilizer. I'm Kira Havens, I'm with Pivot Bio, and we're working with microbes to improve crop nutrition. Now, we just had a discussion about climate change, and I want to say that we know for a fact that agriculture contributes to climate change in the form of nitrous oxide, mostly from fertilizer. In fact, it contributes up to 5% of those greenhouse gases we emit every year. Now, I do want to say that this talk is going to be about how to move from the either-or mindset, from this idea that we can either be economically efficient or environmentally beneficial, and move into a both-and mindset, where what we see are products and processes and technologies that allow us to be both efficient and effective at preserving our environment. Now, we're about to go into a discussion on food and agriculture, and these are really important topics that have a lot of meaning to us. So, I'm gonna ask everyone in the room to take a deep breath, all right? Perfect. Now, how much of that breath was nitrogen? 80%, that's right. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen. But all that nitrogen is inert. It is trapped in a triple bond with itself. It doesn't want to interact with you or any of your biology. Which is weird, because life runs on nitrogen. Every base pair in your DNA has nitrogen in it. All of the amino acids in your proteins have nitrogen in them. We exist because of nitrogen. So that means every single person in this room has to find seven pounds of nitrogen each year from somewhere. But it definitely doesn't come from the atmosphere, at least not directly. And we are not alone in this. Plants need nitrogen, too, for the same reason. They have to make their DNA. They have to make their proteins. And in modern agriculture, we use a lot of nitrogen. We use 250 pounds per acre of nitrogen to make corn. And when you multiply that by 90 million acres of corn in the US alone, that is a huge number. It's a lot of nitrogen that we have to pull in from somewhere. Now, there's a nitrogen cycle, right? It goes from plants to animals to humans. It all feeds back into each other. And it would be great if we could recycle that nitrogen continuously. But this is not a tight, closed loop. A lot of that nitrogen leaches out into water, leaches into the air, leaches into the air excuse me. So how do we go about replenishing this loop? Because if we rely only on the recycling of nitrogen, we know that we don't have enough to support the agriculture we do today. And in fact, Breakthrough wrote specifically about this. There is resource limitation. And what this has resulted in is exploitation and sometimes outright war over what is, quite literally, piles of shit, right? <laughs> These are the Guano Islands off the coast of Peru. There were actual wars, wars waged over those. This is your salt mines, uh, your nitrate mines in Chile. These were rises and falls of empires that we're looking at here. The nitrogen has to come from somewhere. So where does it come from? How do we get from that 78% of nitrogen in the atmosphere into that flux that's a part of that nitrogen cycle? Nature has two ways of doing it. First is lightning. The column of heat and energy arcs through the atmosphere, tears those molecules of nitrogen gas apart, whether they want to or not leaves them free to recombine with hydrogen and oxygen in a way that makes them biologically available. That's, that's part one, lightning. And lightning produces five to 10 teragrams of nitrogen a year. Whatever that exact number is, the microbes actually produce 10 times as much, just to pop. And microbes don't use brute force. Microbes use precision. They are a catalyst. They have an enzyme, a protein, which orients the nitrogen molecule in such a way that it also combines with hydrogen and oxygen and makes it biologically available. But uh, so this is your ammonia molecule. This is your kind of starting point for the nitrogen cycle in biology. Now, at the turn of the last century, we were facing an increase in population. We had a need to improve our agricultural productivity and we were really concerned about how that was gonna happen. Do these kind of sound familiar, right? So, at that point in time, we were far better at working with chemistry and physics than we were at working with biology. So, that's what we started with. We started with the lightning. And we actually found out pretty early on that we could build an electric arc system 
that pulled nitrogen gas out of the air and combined it with biologically available elements, right? So when we were facing this crisis, we kind of doubled down on that. And in Norway, a country with really cheap hydroelectric energy, they built a big version of this, where they went ahead and generated plasma with a huge electric arc machine. It was really, really energetically expensive, but it worked. Now, if you were a country that, say, did not have abundant hydroelectric energy, and you needed nitrogen to feed your people and also to become a military power and to ensure independence, well, you had to find another solution. And that's where Haber-Bosch came into play. And then we kind of stopped. We optimized this. We kept working on it. We got better at it. But Haber-Bosch is still the main source of production for the nitrogen that we use today. And so what that means is that half of the world's population relies on synthetic nitrogen fertilizer from the Haber-Bosch process to eat. That's crazy. That's one of every two of you in this room that would not be here without the Haber-Bosch process. So as productivity increases, we end up with a lot of sustainability challenges, right? This is your either or. That duck is swimming on a pond of algae that's been fed by the nitrogen that runs off the field. And when that algae dies, it's going to suck all of the oxygen out of the water and nothing else will be able to live. Haber-Bosch comes with a lot of issues. 2% of the total world's energy goes into making this nitrogen. Once it gets to the field, half of it just runs off into the water or volatilizes into the air. And that ends up causing $150 billion of impacts in human health for asthmatics that have to deal with the nitrous oxide, um, for the water quality, for tourism, for economic impacts. There's a lot that goes into it. So let's reimagine fertilizer. We have got to figure out how to make an ideal fertilizer. It's got to stay where you put it. It's got to deliver the daily dose of nitrogen to the plants because that changes. It's got to grow with the crop because as the crop gets bigger, it requires more. And it has to be economic and efficient because if it doesn't fit in with the farmer's method of use, nobody's going to use it. So we're looking for a both and. We're looking for an ideal fertilizer. And chemistry does not do this. With chemical nitrogen, you just put it on the ground and you kind of hope it stays there long enough for the plant to get to it. Um, you could get really unlucky and the water could take it all away. But you know what does do this is microbes. Microbes stay in place, they grow on the roots, they deliver the nitrogen in small doses every day. The microbe colony actually grows with the roots of the plant and it is economic and efficient. It definitely doesn't take as much energy to make microbes as it does nitrogen. Now, we can do work in biology now because of two big advances. Well, a, a lot of big advances that have contributed to this. But we understand the dynamic relational interaction between microbes and plants. We know a lot more about it now. And we're still learning more every day. We are also able to look at the genetic basis of nitrogen fixation. For every plant a microbe interaction we look at, we can determine whether they work well together and also whether they're capable of fixing nitrogen. So this is what Pivot Bio does. We look at healthy soils, healthy agricultural groups, we identify the microbes, and then we look at their genes to see if they can fix nitrogen already. And if they can, then we fine tune them. And we bring them back to the farmer so that the farmer's not just working the land, the land is now working for the farmer. The microbes stay rooted. This is a sample of our colonization data. As the plant grows over time, the root system gets more complex, the microbes persist. The microbes grow with the plant. This is a nitrogen need of corn compared to the number of microbes that exist. So the nitrogen source actually increases. And it is economic and efficient. The farmer doesn't have to learn a new process or buy new equipment. They can just drop it right in. But I would like to note that this is not exclusive to the way we do agriculture right now. Any farmer that wants to farm any way can use these microbes. So that's where we are. And we're just beginning our sustainability story, but it looks like this could have a huge impact. Even if we reduce farmers' use of nitrogen by only 10%, by 25 pounds, we end up pulling 400,000 tons of nitrogen out of the waterways. We end up taking the equivalent of a million cars off the road. And that's just step one, right? So it's an exciting time. We think the new nitrogen looks a lot like the old nitrogen. It just works a little better with modern farming. And that's what we think the future of fertilizer will be. So I would love to chat with you guys more. Please come find me. I'm easy to identify. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.